Okay. Now we have the recording has started. So uh, officially we're starting this section session three. Uh, 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 on on program comprehension, and I know. Uh, uh, I hope you had we have in a nice pre short talk presentations and and discussion. Uh, I'll be here with um, Adin Kud. Uh, he will will be co-shared in this session with me, okay? Uh, so, uh, let's start. We, we have uh, here in the session uh, the order of presentation, I guess. Uh, so, the first one to, to present uh, will be uh, Jeff Hi Jeff, how are you? <laughs> Hello. Oh, I'm ready anytime. Okay, so please make yourself comfortable. You can start the presentation. Okay. Remember the screen sharing? Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, thank you. I think you can share. Are you able to share it? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure I got the right, the right choice. Uh, okay. It's catered than Zoom. <laughs> so, so thank you, uh, Christina. Thanks to everybody for coming. That's interesting. With the, all the different time zones. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, Jeff. Not here. I apologize. Okay. Oh, okay, Jeff. I was <laughs> yes. I was muted. I don't uh, bugs in the software, so that's my thing. Uh, so I, I think our host is from Brazil, so I was explaining. I, I said, yeah. To uh, celebrate the end of the day, it's uh, past my bedtime, so if I don't make much sense, uh, <laughs> forgive me. Um, this session, I think, has talks from several tracks. My mm -hmm. paper is in the the software education track, SEET. Um, so you'll get you get a, uh, a smattering of different topics. So let me jump in. Um, my talk is about a. a it's an experience report on on a final exam style that we came up with because of the pandemic. So when we did this sudden online shutdown in uh, March of 2020, um, we're trying to present how to teach my material on this new platform week by week, like everybody else in the world, right? And uh, but I kept thinking about the final exam. How do we do the final exam? And I, we, we couldn't bring people into a room and watch them. Uh, the lockdown browser kind of approaches, it turns out they're easy to defeat. They also throw up a lot of false positives. And the, there's a lot of evidence that they're really bad for certain people, particularly disadvantaged minority people. So I didn't want to do that. So the idea that we came up with was was a, a skills demonstration kind of exam. So uh, the idea is to give students problems and have them solve those problems within certain constraints. And the most serious constraint is 
they do the work themselves, uh, but they also uh, are doing this by themselves with nobody watching. So how do we how do we ensure that each student does something different? And I borrowed something from uh, a, a, from a, a, an activity called Odyssey of the Mind that is primarily for small children, uh, well, school age children, usually age six through twelve, although. The, there, there are older, older uh, groups sometimes do this, but if you haven't heard of this, if, but you've seen the movie The Martian, they always say The Martian is two and a half hours of Odyssey of the Mind. It's that kind of applying science and engineering to solve problems in a creative way. But the key for me was the divergent thinking, which means that there are multiple solutions and multiple good solutions. And so, so students in this case can have different ideas, different ways to solve this and still have correct answers. So my question was, can I design exam and have enough divergence so that a class full of students will each come up with something unique so that I can tell each person did their own work. So they, I could tell they weren't working together. Uh, secondarily, I was also wondering how long it would take to grade the exams when everything was different. And I was actually pretty worried about that, and I was prepared to spend a, a ridiculous amount of time grading if, if that's what it took. But, I'm, but I did want to try the idea at first. And then how long would it take to create the exam? Because that's also pretty different. So uh, this is what I came up with. So. I have here two things on the slide. Divergent properties, which are uh, ways in which the exam allows to let students make choices that can lead in different solution directions. So I, I, I've done this in a two, I was doing this in two classes in spring 2020, and we've tried it in a few others, but I have just the one example is a web development where, where I'm teaching students how to develop web apps. And here are the so, so the problem was to develop a small web application, deploy it, give me the URL so I could run it, and share with me the code so I could look at the code. Uh, the divergences came from several places. So the first was functional requirements. So I gave students a collection of functional requirements and let them choose. So one semester is four out of eight. It was two out of five in another semester. So it depends on the problem as many options as I can think of. The students chose the software design, and there are lots of ways to design this. It's big enough so that they could go in different ways, but not so big that it takes forever to finish, of course. Part of this course was about usability, and so they were responsible for designing the user interface themselves, and that leads to a lot of diversity, even both in the small things and big things. And then we taught a tough, we used a couple of different technologies in the class, uh, and some students also used technologies that they had learned in previous classes or at work or, or whatever. So they weren't restricted to just what we did in class, so that adds more divergence, and then how they deploy it. So altogether, these, this kind of divergence could lead to tens of thousands of possible solutions, which meant plenty of divergence and the chances of two programs being very similar accidentally was almost was almost zero. So then the observations, um, and there's a lot more detail about this and another class in the paper, by the way. So first off, it was easy to see that each exam was different. Each, because they're building software. The user interfaces were different. The software structure was different. Uh, and it was small enough so I could see the structure, but big enough so that there are lots of choices. Uh, and they had all these different different choices. So it was actually really easy to see the divergence and that nobody actually worked together on, on the exams. I was very happily surprised, but very surprised, but also happily that the grading took less time than my traditional exams of questions and answers. Uh, part of it, I think, was um, it doesn't really take long to run a small program, enter a few inputs to see if they work. Uh, part of it is I was mostly focused on my rubric was do the feature do the features work and uh, was the design sensible and was the user interface design that it have any usability problem. So 
So, so those things don't actually take much time to, to resolve uh, or to, to evaluate. And then I looked at the code, and the code was small enough, uh, so that didn't take long either. So instead of about 30 to 45 minutes per student exam regularly, it took me about 10 minutes after, after the first two or three. Uh, the one thing I lost, I think, is ability to assess this the deeper theoretical concepts, which we teach, but they just don't come up except in larger scale programs than we can use in this kind of uh, in this kind of setting. And the same thing with a, a testing course was my other course. The deeper theoretical concepts require bigger and more complicated programs than I was able to assign them for this kind of exam. So bottom line is, I think this was a better exam than my traditional question and answer exam. Easier to grade and not that hard to create. And that's what I, that's my new normal. That's what I'm using going forward. So okay. thanks for staying up so late or getting up so early, some of you. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for your presentation. Um, I, uh, <laughs> uh, please, do you have any questions for Jeff? So his, this is a paper from the, the soft engineering education track. Oh, well. Happy to go yes. on. You have five papers and we can, any questions I can yeah. do in the chat or later. Yes. So please uh, engage, put the questions on the chat and, and then we'll have uh, uh, a discussion by the end. So let's uh, continue and the next presenter will be uh, we have uh, Juan, is the presenter of uh, the technical track paper, uh, retrieving data constraint implementation using fine grained code patterns. Hello, Juan. Hello. Oh, Can you hear me? Nice to meet you. Right. Uh -huh. All right. Good. Nice. Sharing my screen here. All right. Okay, so thank you everybody for attending the talk. My name is Juan Flores and I'll be presenting the paper Retrieving Data Concern Implementations Using Fine Grained Code Patterns, which is a collaboration with my UTD colleagues, Jonathan Perry, Shi Wei, and Andy Marcus. First of all, the main background concept that enables the research is data constraints. They are business rules, commonly found requirements, and they impose restrictions on the allowed values of data in the software domain. For example, a blood type can only be one of these valid types, one of these valid values. Then uh, in a previous uh, study, we discovered that data constraints are implemented we're using a set of data definition statements and a constraint enforcing statement, which defines the logic of the constraint. We also observed that data constraint can be of one of four types and that there are 30 constraint implementation patterns that are used to implement them. These uh, constraint types and patterns are published as a catalog. And a very important observation is that the 10 most frequent implementation patterns implement most of the constraints. Not only this, but certain data constraint types are more likely to be implemented with a particular pattern. For example, for value comparison constraints, 91% of instances are implemented using the binary comparison pattern. We sought to exploit these findings and we developed an approach called LASSO which for a given constraint that is given as a, with its context, uh, the type, its operands, and with the source code, it returns a ranked list of methods. And inside of it, one of, inside each one of these methods, it outputs a list of uh, enforcing statement candidates. It does this by combining any existing traceability link recovery technique and a set of ASD-based pattern detectors that we developed. We implemented 13 detectors for the most commonly occurring uh, constraint implementation patterns. 
and the detectors traverse the AST and check that each node is an uh, incidence of the pattern. And if it is, it they produce an enforcing statement candidate. Then Lasso needs to rank these enforcing statement candidates. And for this, it uses a set of heuristics. Each heuristics is a heuristic is assigned a score from zero to one. We use the we feed the data constraint context to a traceability linear query, link recovery technique. And this core is based on the rank of the candidates method in the resulting list. We compare the percentage of turn overlap between the operands of the constraints of the candidates. And we do this both ways to account for the case where there's high overlap, but there are unrelated terms. We also uh, calculate the percentage term overlap between the constraint operand and the candidate block, which is the set of statements that is executed after checking the constraint, if the enforcing statement appears in an if or while statement. And finally, we check if the candidate is of the pattern that we would expect for that type of constraint. To evaluate Lasso, we propose three variations which are different on wh in which uh, traceability land recovery technique they build on top of. That is uh, Lucene, also using the vector space model and latent semantic indexing. And we compare each class of variant against it, it's the, the technique that builds on top of as a baseline. We use the data set of 299 constraints from eight Java systems where the enforcing statement for each constraint was set manually. And we use the metric percentage hit set N because we believe it's easy to interpret. This metric ca captures the percentage of constraints where the ground truth was retrieved within the first N method results. But we'll, we're also interested in finding out how highly the enforcing statement is ranked within its corresponding method. We see that uh, Lasso outperforms all the baselines, which uh, with a better performance for the lowest uh, performing baselines, it, it, it gives more improvement in this case. And the best performing Lasso version can find the, the correct method where the constraint is implemented in almost 70% of cases. Also, 80% of enforcing statements are retrieved between positions one and three within their corresponding method. So in conclusion, we discovered that there are data constraints can be in four types. They can be implemented using one of 30 implementation patterns, and they're implemented in larger predictable ways. We designed a tool called Lasso that can accurately trace data constraints and at both method and line of code level. It outperforms the baselines and uh, it can be extended using additional detectors. And that is all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Congratulations. Now, thank you. as well, if you have any questions from Juan, please engage in to the chat and, and ask uh, with his name, okay? Uh, so we go, we proceed for the next presentation. Uh, this, uh, the paper that will be presented by Love Heat. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm speaking your name correctly. Uh, the, the title is Support Program Comprehension by generating abstract code summary tree. Okay, so, hello. Thank you. <laughs> you can start. Yeah, sure. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is my screen visible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Well, I'm titled "Supporting Attention by Generating Abstract." Uh, 
and my co-authors are Dr. Bonani Roy and Dr. Kevin Schneider. The uh, behind the study was to help uh, developers code reading activity in daily uh, code reading to read a lot of code from what they write and the 10 to 1. Uh, also, the code which is written by others, so they have very less idea about that. Also, uh, many projects follow proper documentation guidelines. Uh, someone is onboarded into the project, uh, they struggle to find relevant parts. So as the project takes more time, that software development cost increases. So our motivation decrease software development cost uh, uh, so, so we can uh, produce uh, better software cheaply. So uh, we wanted to help reducing the uh, program comprehension time. And also we help uh, if in hand uh, they can get some help to do that faster so, uh, here we show a diagram like how to uh, generate geometry uh, first we uh, 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 source uh, so we extracted from python code and we generated the static code graph after that we, uh, generated the execution paths uh, from the call and then we to create the tree in a real subject system paths are low and the cluster tree is heavy and it's not flexible to browsing so we did some processing and applied some technique accessible and usable in a daily coding activity so uh, uh, simple so here is a uh, 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 we had a calculator margin so we can see uh, in there are the possible scenarios of the code and uh, in the higher levels are abstraction nodes so we try to abstract this execution path so that uh, by observing high level nodes developers can get a good understanding so for example uh, in uh, n10 uh, abstract node 10 we can see it's saying add divide mod subtract so uh, basically all the execution paths are so uh, this is uh, how we uh, try to abstract the nodes. But the problem is uh, providing QRs is not sufficient. So we felt the need to have some uh, natural text summary and uh, uh, patterns of the execution. Uh, it is not feasible to show all of them. So we provided uh, two uh, two more information in the ACS tree. Uh, and we have uh, two scenarios to uh, evaluate the tree. So first one is whether developers can get of the system. And the second one is if they can get help doing a specific. So we did a uh, uh, study uh, with a side data manager project. We collected the source code. And we invited the developers to participate in our study, and uh, three of the developers uh, who had a good idea about the system participated. Uh, we they uh, our system in two use cases, and they also uh, answered some open-ended questions. Uh, uh, all of the candidates find the node names uh, helpful, and uh, this names. Uh, give some hint about some high level fit behind this show see the uh, natural text summary uh, they saw uh, they also uh, uh, appreciated that because it explains in natural text uh, what that note titles uh, mean and also 
previously uh, there was just randomly exploring the tree but we have some mechanism so that uh, they can search for a specific methods and highlight in the tree and explore that so they also like that approach uh, as they can search method names and also they suggested uh, when they have to change some part code or method uh, highlight in the tree and go to different uh, execution scenarios to know what they need to uh, show uh, of our application uh, provided to the users. So in the website, developers can select the subject system and they can search. And, uh, middle, we can see the abstract tree and developers can go deep inside and uh, inside the highlight notes to uh, uh, read uh, task in hand uh, they if they select then they show the note summary and execution patterns the information about. and uh, i'm planning to integrate so that developers can like explain their code in our tool and uh, browse uh, the industry and also uh, uh, not uh, all the teams uh, uh, have the practice to use so we have some plan to uh, incorporate common generation techniques and uh, uh, in our some uh, users suggested to have some uh like export use it in the documentation so we'll add that and uh, we'll add searching by access in addition to methods thank you thank you uh, thank you for your presentation um, again uh, any questions you please uh, ask them using our chat uh, so the next presentation uh, is uh, the paper uh, will be presented by Dizzy Wong. It's bridging pre-trained models and downstream tasks for source code understanding. Uh, hello, Daisy. Are you there? Okay. <laughs> So you may start, please. Hear me? Okay, hello everyone. I'm very honored to be with this speech. My name is Dozu Wang from National University of Defense Technology. The paper I'm going to present is Bridging pre trained Models and Downstream Tasks for Source Code Understanding. I will briefly describe the goal, solution, and the experimental results of this work. As you all know, Pre-trained models have been emerging in recent years. However, these pre-training works require huge computing resources. Our goal is to design a lightweight approach that can quickly adapt. Sorry. Okay. Uh, that can quickly adapt diverse, uh, diverse uh, pre-trained models to different downstream tasks. As the title says, bridging pre uh, pre models and downstream tasks. We also expect this lightweight approach to satisfy learning the rich thematic information for the code. Or fitting to the target. Uh, 
uh, I was closer to the focus on data and the design approach on top of the existing traditional model model function paradigm. Briefly, we enlarge the downstream task data sets with data argumentation and rank them uh, rank these data sets using uh, curriculum learning and fine tune downstream tasks using existing virtual models. Our uh, method allows uh, existing virtual models to achieve new state of uh, performance on uh, three tasks. Uh, that uh, augmentation, uh, uh, algorithm class, uh, classification, uh, task, uh, code column detection task, and uh, code search task. Uh, the data operation models and the implementation, uh, implementation of our approach are publicly available at this link. Uh, for details, they refer to our video and the paper. Thank you very much. Okay. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you have this two minutes if you want, <laughs> but okay. So uh, uh, let's. Uh, go to our uh, last presentation. Uh, it's um, practitioners' expectations on automated code comment generation. It will be presented by. Is that oh she, okay? <laughs> okay, may start please. Can you see my slide here? Hi, good morning and good evening. I'm Xin from Zhejiang University. It's a great honor to share my recent work named uh, aims to investigate practitioners' expectations on automated code comment generation techniques. According to the best programming practices, Writing meaningful code comments is necessary to help other people get to read your code and understand it. Although important, there is always a gap between theory and practice. Therefore, the first research question in this paper investigates the state of the code commenting practices and the issues during the, uh, during the development. Uh, recently, uh, different approaches and tools have been proposed to generate uh, comments. Uh, however, there is no study to investigate what, whether they are important for developers. In this study, we conduct an interview and a survey to investigate are such tools useful for practitioners. Then we man practitioners' expectations on code comment generation tools. Finally, we compare the current state of the art of studies and the practitioners' expectations on such tools. The gap between them motivates the community to propose more useful tools for developers. The overview of the methodology in our study is shown in this figure. It mainly consists of three stages, including the interview with professionals online survey and the literature review. These three stages aim to answer the proposed research questions I have introduced above. In the interview stage, we ask the open-ended questions about what they consider to be a good or bad code comment. And we also ask the interviewees to discuss the commenting practices and the issues that they faced related to the code comments. To confirm the statements made by the interviewees in the first stage, we conduct an online survey with more participants. Our participants come from both professionals from IT companies and the open source practitioners that we uh, contacted with them from the GitHub. In total, we received 720 valid responses. In the last stage, 
We collected research papers about code comment generation techniques published in, in, in both software engineering and artificial intelligence fields. And, and, and we also investigate the gap between the current state of the art and the particip participants' expectations we obtained from the online survey. According to the responses, we found that more than 80% participants claim that they often read comments. However, almost the same amount of uh, participants said that the quality of comment is still not enough for them to read source code. Their opinion on writing and reading comments are contrary. Everyone wants others to write as many, as, as many comments as possible, but they don't want to write comments. The most of two critical commenting, commenting issues are lack of comments and to general comments without useful information. According to the survey, 80% participants give essential and was well rating for code comment generation tools. Among them, 18% rate essential and would use it every day during the development. Considering the participants' expectations, most participants prefer to generate method level comments with functionality, how to use, and the input and output, and the design rationale. Then we also present the factors that affect pra practitioners' likelihood to adopt such a tool. And we found that the overlapped engrams between them received the least support from the participants. In the last research question, we compare the current state of the art research and practitioners' expectations. And we find a huge, huge gap between the theory and the practice. Also, in this paper, we also find some uh, interesting implications from developers, such as they hope a uh, completion tools, or they hope uh, a comment that describes why a code snippet exists. Thank you. For more details, please refer to our preprint or contact me with email. Thanks. Okay. Okay, Xinhu, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, thank you all. So now let's go for the questions and answers and, and discussions of the papers, please. Let me see what we have here. Uh, if you feel okay, you can uh, open uh, your camera and, 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 and make microphone uh, to ask a question. Uh, we can all also follow uh, the list of questions. Hello, Laura? Um, I, I can start. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is for Jeff. Um, I was wondering if there were any negative results from his study, um, as in something that he wouldn't try again in his classes, some exercise that maybe, I don't know, uh, didn't get the expected results. Okay, Jeff? I'm not sure. Jeff, are you here? Uh, Loda, yes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, do you want to answer or I can read your answer? Uh, so, Loda asked about uh, any negative results. And he said a couple of things. In the testing class, I found it was challenging to find programs to test that were small enough for student, students to grasp quickly, yet with enough complexity. Oh, you are here. Can you answer? Dev. So, with the dev web dev class, my first final exam program took some students more time than expected. I scaled the size back in future course. I think we lost in both the ability to evaluate students 
on some of the deeper theoretical concepts here you mentioned in your presentation. But the more I thought about that, the more I wondered how important it is to separate the top three or four students from the next seven or eight. Do you want to elaborate that on that, Jeff? Okay, and oh, right here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Tried to unmute. It spun around for a while, and then it gave me some error. Mm -hmm. I am so my research is in testing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, I think you repeated what I had answered, and those I think yeah. those, were the, 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 those were the key issue. Um, I, and just to expand a little bit, I think when people are given programming problems, and I've seen this in other studies years ago, and when I and I've seen this myself sometimes, um, there's a huge variance in the amount of time it takes students to complete a programming task. And not just not just students, but also professionals. And uh, that wasn't what I was trying to measure in the final. But the first time I did this, most of the class finished in about an hour. Most some of the class took a couple of hours, which was the stated time for the final exam. But there are a few students who took several hours, and they went down, you know, some some uh, obscure, unfortunate path. And it wasn't. Was it the best or the worst students? So it was it was a mix of students who actually took the most time. So I don't think it was correlated with just how good, how well they understood the material or how well, how good they were at programming. They just, it took some longer. So I scaled back the size. So the first time I did this in the web development course, it was four out of eight features. The next time it was two out of five, which ass assessed what they're doing just as well, but it took less time. So that was, that was an important, Take away. And another thing I forgot in the when I was typing is one semester I had a, a project that had to do with uh, processing logical lo logical predicates, and one of the one of the functional requirements was to write the truth table based on a based on a given logical predicate predicate. And I did that myself, started the program myself. And I spent about two and a half hours figuring out how to write a truth table, which was surprisingly hard <laughs> in <the> algorithm. <laughs> and I, I, I thought I finished, and then I realized, oh, there's this one case where it didn't handle. Uh, and then I looked on the web, and I found some algorithms. So I gave them that algorithm uh, because that was what I was trying to measure. Um, and it turns out it's actually a surprisingly complicated recursive task to just to print a simple truth, truth table. Uh, that was surprising to me. Um, so, do it yourself. That's actually really important. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do do the problem yourself beforehand, just to find issues. And I had my GTAs also do most of these usually. Mm -hmm. That that helped as well. Although, yeah, most GTAs tend to be better programmers than undergraduates. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that that's so there were some there were some negative. And as I mentioned, I think I lost the ability to evaluate the deeper theoretical concepts. And I just ultimately decided I don't think that matters very much for this course, for these courses. So, does that help, Laura? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I see. I think we have the next, the next question here for Iswa. Uh, Masood asks, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Um, hi. Uh, hi. Thank you. I <laughs> make another question. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK. So the question is about uh, the vocabulary mismatch uh, between the requirement description as well as the code elements. So this is a kind of very common problem for any kind of text retrieval. So I was just wondering how that problem was resolved or is this application is only for a particular application domain where the requirement description and the code are sharing pretty much the similar type of vocabulary. 
Yes, so the framework as we propose it in the paper does require that there to be an overlap between the requirements and the source code because most of the heuristics are based on this uh, percentage of term overlap. However, we did identify a few, uh, as if you will, low hanging fruit that can even be applied in pre processing, wouldn't even be required, wouldn't even require changing the, the, the framework. So we can use spell checking, uh, identifier splitters, uh, thesauri, which uh, we did identify in the cases where we weren't able to retrieve the the correct statement. These were the causes. So we this means that some of the causes of uh, our tool being ineffective are easy to fix. However, in some other cases, we identified that we need something like flow-based static analysis. And for this, uh, for this to improve actually our, our framework, we would require some better way of uh, identifying these data definition statements. So if we can, I can just share this for a second. Remember that uh, a constraint can be implemented as a is an enforcing statement, but it's associated also with a set of data definition statements. And it's an intuitive way of tracing a constraint to find these data definition statements first, and then it, you can use a slice, basically slice from each, and you'll probably get to the enforcing statement where the, where those slices intersect. Problem is that there is a, a significantly less information in the data, data definition statement. Since we, here we have only a get age and 45, for example, while in the, in the enforcing statement we have the whole method to serve as context. So we could explore some ways to get the constraint operands and map them to a set of data definition statements. I suspect some sort of uh, learning, probably word embedding would work here in the case where the, the terms are not exactly the same. In this case, it will be sort of straightforward at ages in, in both of them, but also there can be many places in the code where you, you can find that age in a data definition. So sifting through sifting through those definitions is also going to be a problem but um yes yeah, so we in summary the tool does require that agreement right now but we are we're working on ways to make it so that we're more resilient to that vocabulary mismatch okay thank you thank you Laura. okay um so let me see if we have another question. Okay, we have a question from Masood again. Uh, uh, do you want to ask your question again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, right now, I think uh, if I have followed the uh, talk properly, so uh, right now the comment that is generated is the comments that is generated is from the developer written comments from the different yes. ASD nodes. So if you combine the description from these different nodes, do they uh, look cohesive uh, to the developers? That means do they really make sense in terms of functional requirements for that particular code? Yeah, uh, so in the interview so far uh, from, the, like, uh, from the users, it seemed uh, they they uh, they like that and uh, they thought uh, it's good but i think uh, like to generalize or claim something bold we need to like do more large scale study on that but but uh, uh, but the summary seemed promising from the study okay thank you thank you okay Let's follow that. Um, oh, as you says, uh, oh, another question here for uh, she. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the first question, I invite the professionals from the uh, IT company by uh by, by our contactors such as by friends uh and uh, 
my, my friends can send some uh, invitation emails to his colleagues. And uh, for the uh, open source participants, we contact the uh, GitHub. We, we, we can have them by emailing them and, uh, and understand them uh, the way by, by, by Google's by Google form. And uh, I, I removed biases from the uh, survey. We found that uh, many uh, participants uh, finish his survey by less than um, three minutes. It is not uh, reasonable. So we exclude the survey they fin finished by uh, three minutes. And we also um, we will also add some more specific uh, uh, questions that we exclude. Um, that uh, someone he doesn't have uh, he, he doesn't have um, have experiences on the software development, uh, or he's just uh, um, finished some uh, limited questions. Most of the questions. Uh, if most questions are black, we will exclude the question, the, the survey, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Oh, um, this, um, the paper from for the sheet. <laughs> I, I, I found it, um, uh, very interesting. But I know we have, a, uh, although the session is under program comprehension, we had, uh, uh, different uh, kinds of paper and different contributions. Uh, I found very interesting for my 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 research uh, interests, uh, and I think uh, I hope to see more results uh, as soon as possible. Uh, because I found it uh, very interesting the the approach the the way the the information is presented, and hope that you can evaluate it, it uh, for the work with more uh, developers. Uh, so, congratulations. Uh, uh, for the other works uh, as well. So she just talked about her, her work on uh, automated comment generation. Uh, this is quite interesting as well. <laughs> uh, and I think it was very nice to, to see uh, for uh, um, uh, for our research questions and the way you exploited your work from interviews and and surveys and and literature review and then putting them together okay uh, thank you all for your uh, for your talks uh the other work as well uh, thank you uh jeff i saw your presentation earlier <laughs> the comprehension of no, in the teaching software skills was really many questions it was uh, very interesting uh juan <laughs> uh, i think it's quite interesting you have a, a um uh, work on on uh, uh, constraints and data traceability supported by uh, uh, a tool uh, 
I think we quite need something like that to see uh, how our business rules uh, are, are mapped to our source code and then have uh, ask questions and perform several tasks uh, during uh, related to co code co uh, program comprehension. Uh, finally, uh, it was uh, Daisy Van. Yes, it's an, an important uh, work. I, I I'm not sure I have any questions for him, but uh, it's it's uh, I think there there is a lot of challenges, uh, and you you had interesting results. Yeah, if you want to to comment on that. Please uh, feel we are reaching the end of the session. So if, if you have any comments or questions, this is the time. Let's see. So. I guess um, from the four, five presentations, four uh, of them were previously previously presented. Only Juan's talk uh, will be presented in uh, I think tomorrow's uh, one. Uh, uh, Program comprehension five, okay? I think it's that, okay. That was yesterday. I think. Ah, this what yesterday? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because of the number, I thought it was uh, so. Same. Then that is. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, Hope you have a nice uh, uh, event today and see you. I'll be chairing another session on Friday on soft ecosystems. I hope to meet you there, okay? Thank you. If you have further questions, I think you can ask directly to the authors, okay? And explore the mid space environment and chat rooms and so on. So, okay. Bye bye. Okay, I think it stops. Uh, I, add, I think we uh, recording. I think this automatic stop. It stops automatically recording. I hope so.